for copyright stuff for um, because we're not schools technically libraries. Mm -hmm. So schools have a little bit more leeway in terms of being able to their use. We don't have that mm -hmm. thing here. If it's used for teaching and instruction at, at a university or a, a college school, usually there's a little bit more leeway mm -hmm. in terms of breaking it up as long as it's properly titled, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. Public libraries don't have the same resource. If so, if it's copyright, it's you know it's a violation, even if it's being used for education, yeah. which I yeah. think is an oversight. Yeah, that's a good point. It makes it harder for people to monitor their use. Yeah. 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 Okay, and then we'll probably go live soon just so the video exists, so they might hear the sound, so they won't see the video just yet. Okay. We like to go live a little bit early just so that people sure. don't panic about the fact that they don't have a link ahead of time, but if they come to the YouTube page, they'll still find it right away.
your stuff is just amazing. I've seen her on YouTube, or I forget what show, maybe it was TV, I don't know, whatever special she had, mm -hmm. at some point I saw her, and it's just really impressive. But what if we saw her stuff at the MFA, too? Right? Yeah. At the fa yeah. Yeah. Fabric of a Nation, yeah, Mary had gone to that, too. I think that probably my favorite textile will be one of the ones I'm showing, Harriet Powers. Okay. Um, just because it has a lot of meaning for me um, for several reasons. But I you like to. Like kind of fabric or just a. Both. Oh, okay. I initially meant, I, and that first question mm -hmm. I initially meant, but I didn't know if that was uh, too difficult a question. <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot out there. <laughs> but what I mostly work with is cotton. Okay. Um, prefer working with cotton but I work you know I work with just about anything um, I make ballet costumes and those are not usually made out of cotton so um, but when I make things that I want to make usually they're that's my fabric of choice I said a little bit and very poorly <laughs> it's all right and, and um, I'm just so impressed by you know the capacity to envision something from scratch because of course I have patterns mm -hmm. I, I knit, but just from patterns. I don't, I don't know how to knit from scratch. But yeah. Mary, what kind of sewing do you do? I do basically. I'm going to call them art quilts. Now they're not. They're, they're walls. I, I did one of, of uh, someone of my family. I did one of, of uh, what I, I. I went to the um, Houston International Quilt Show several years ago. If I see something simple that I like that's colorful, mm -hmm. I'll copy that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've never had an original thought in my head, but if <laughs> I see something that I, that I like, uh -huh. I'll just put a copy in. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, if you put me in a room with fabric and a sewing machine, I wouldn't know what to do, but give me a picture, and I'll, I'll go from there. Interesting. But I love the, I love the title. No kidding. Based up, not this was before the Patricia Butler came out, but I had a friend look at it and say, no. Um, <laughs> but I thought it was pretty good. It's still hanging on the wall. I think it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, art is subjective, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. The only person who really matters is the one who made it. Exactly. Yeah. It's funny because most messengers are true artists with like watercolors and oil paint and drawing. <coughs> Minored in sculpture for mm. her, her degree. Like, no, six, eight years. No. But I can craft like nobody's yeah. business. You know, yeah. I made my dough and I do some paper crafting and stitch my sweet, like, sell patterns and collages and stuff. And so I can't come up with an original thought to save my life, but I can <laughs> make, craft, make something, mm -hmm. like, draw something, you know. It's all good. Yeah. I love African quilts. I love the, co the color. Oh, aren't they wonderful? Yeah. And it's just You must be familiar with G's Ben yes. quilts, yeah. Yes.
I don't It's up to you. I, I don't okay, need it. cool. All right, 10 seconds and then I'll go? Yeah. Cool. A little bit more of a process when you've got technology like this. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody in home, in home, in the room and at home. We're so excited to have you here for another lifelong learning lecture. Um, tonight, we are very excited to feature Professor Pam Seabor Cable. She will be talking to us about textiles as storytellers from the Bayou Tapestry to Bisha Butler. A few quick announcements before we get going. For the folks who are in the room, please go ahead and take this opportunity to turn off your cell phones, any ringers, alarms, anything like that. Go ahead and turn those off for us. Uh, folks at home, please feel free to kick back and grab your favorite beverage. Um, for those of you in the room as well, we would love to hear from you on our evaluation forums on the back table tonight, what you thought about tonight's event, if you have any ideas for future events, and if you're not already on our mailing list, we would love to have you join us. We're the library, so the only thing we'll ever send you is more information about great free library programs. As I mentioned, this is a partnership with Framingham State University, and if you're not familiar with their Adventures program, um, that is starting soon as well. Those are the morning classes, and we are the evening lectures, so we invite you to check out both of those, including next week's evening lecture, and I've got my cheat sheet here. It is going to be on November 16th, that's next Thursday at 7 p.m., here in the costume room and also live online. We are very excited to feature Anna Tucker from the Framingham History Center, and she will be presenting on Collective Journeys, Framingham's global migration story, past and present. And she will be featuring some uh, sneak peeks on their upcoming um, new display. So we hope that you will join us for that. But for tonight, we are so excited to welcome, welcome Professor Seaport Cable. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for coming to the Framingham Public Library, both in person and online. I'd like to thank Lara, as well as Don De La Santa and the people of the Lifelong Learning Lecture Series for inviting me here tonight. This evening, we will look at a sampling of woven works of art that each provide insight into our shared history. They tell stories of reality and fantasy, of violence and hope, and of the rich and famous as well as ordinary people. They span nearly 1,000 years and include techniques of embroidery, tapestry weaving, applique quilting, and mixed media. All were intended to tell stories in their own way. You may be wondering what these two images have in common. They both use textiles as a medium and tell the stories of actual events in history. They both tell a story of great violence although one is intended as a realistic depiction, and in the other, the violence is apparent only in the title. On the left is the Bio Tapestry from the 11th century, and on the right is Four Little Girls, September 15th, 1963, by Bisa Butler. Many of you may recognize this event without further explanation, but this work is an homage to the four little girls who were murdered in the bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Both these works tell their story through textile imagery, and each one speaks to acts of unspeakable violence. We will begin with an ancient work from the Viking Age known as the Bayou Tapestry. Few works in cloth exist from this period due to the fragile nature of textiles. This work is exceptional considering its age and its importance in the telling of history. If one looks for information on William the Conqueror's 1066 Battle of Hastings, you will most likely see images from the Bayou Tapestry. It is a remarkable retelling of the battle, as well as a glimpse into the lives of 11th century life in Europe. Most written history tells of kings and battles, but what is different about this work is that it includes references to everyday life. There are scenes of agriculture, food preparation, shipbuilding, astronomy, and other interesting aspects of medieval times. The image in the upper left shows shipbuilding methods. The two on the right show preparation and serving of a meal 
And we can see by these that there's no use of forks yet as they're stabbing their food with a skewer. And the lower left shows uh, the farm tools that were used in medieval times. Images of animals, at times decorative and fantastical, and others portraying fables, appear in the borders along with images of human activity. The work is not actually a tapestry, but an embroidered cloth of linen measuring approximately 230 feet long by 20 inches tall. It is not known for certain who commissioned the work, but is believed to have been Bishop Odo, who was William the Conqueror's stepbrother. Since history is most often written, or in this case embroidered, by the victors, this work tells the Norman story side of the story. It is likely to have been embroidered by women needleworkers in the 1070s and 80s. And a lot of times here I'm going to say likely because we, we don't really know for sure. There, there's not um, concrete evidence, but there's been a lot of scholarly work on this. There are written descriptions in the scroll, written in Latin, which was the universal Western language at the time. This may have been added later to ensure that the images would be understood by later generations. The scroll tells the story of William, Duke of Normandy, who believed he was heir to the British throne when Edward the Confessor died. The Anglo-Saxon King Harold of England felt he was the proper heir to the throne, and the battle begins as William's forces land on English shores. William's army prevails, and he is crowned king, beginning the Norman rule of England. In this first slide, we see Edward the Confessor. I'm not going to go through all 58 of the images, so, um, but just I'm going to pick out some highlights. Um, this is Edward the Confessor, seen underneath the, um, the canopy there. Um, both William and Harold serve the king in the Battle of Brittany. So for the first half, almost, of the scroll, the two enemies at the end are actually working together. Um, so until they fight over who is going to be the, the heir to Edward, um, they are working together. In this little vignette here, um, this is an image of they believe to be some, a woman named Elfgeva. It actually says this above the, um, the woman standing there. Uh, it says clerk and Elfiga, but they don't really tell us anything about the story. Um, it's believed that this might have been some sort of scandal that everyone would have known about back then, but in a sort of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink to those of us now, because we see below her there's an image of a naked man in the same uh, position as the cleric is. So there's maybe a hint that there was something going on there. So little stories like this appear uh, within the, the um, battle scenes as well. But here we start to see more of the battle scenes. Uh, this takes place at the Battle of Brittany. And again, this is when William and Harold are still working together. Um, it shows them burning a bridge, which was one of William the Conqueror's uh, tools of the trade. Uh, he was very big on burning things behind him, so we'll see this more as we go along. Uh, but they are still working together at this point. And this is William and Harold together. You can see them discussing something. But then we get to the point where Edward dies. So if you look in the to, under number 25, um, you can see Edward is not looking too great. He's sitting on a bed. There's people kind of with their heads bowed a little bit. And when we get to scene 26, we see him being carried um, on his funeral bed. And then 27 and 28 shows people mourning the death of the king. Above the king, there is a woman on the upper left who may be his wife, Queen Edith. Um, again, it's not spelled out, but it would be logical that that's who that woman would be. So this is the thick of the battle. Um, the Normans were chivalrous knights, so they had the advantage of being on horseback, where the, um, most of the English troops were uh, foot soldiers. The English were also at a disadvantage because they had just fought the Vikings in the north. So 
uh, not all their troops were available for this battle, and those that were could have been tired or just a little bit worn out from, from the other battles. So we start to see the um, intense battle here with the um, Normans on the left and the right. We think of chival chivalrous knights as being sort of glamorous and um, you know, doing kind things, throwing, um, throwing their coats over puddles for women, but they were a tough bunch. They, they were pretty, um, pretty warlike and very well trained. This is what they did for a living was, was go to war. So if there was not a war, they were looking for a war. Um, one thing you notice here too is that on the bottom panel, uh, you start to see a change from showing images of nature and animals into the spilling over of the dead bodies from the, from the battle. And as you get to the further right side, um, you can see heads being lopped off. So it gets pretty graphic uh, for a scroll. It, it, um, it shows a lot of violent activity. Uh, when you look at this, it's sort of in the middle between 56 and 57. Uh, it says that Harold dies. So it's quite possible that Harold is the the person to the right of the black horse uh, that has fallen, that could be King Harold, but it also could be uh, further over to the left, number 56, you see a man down with his head on the ground because Harold was killed by an arrow going through his eye, or at least that's what it's believed to have been. So either one of those could be Harold, um, but again, you're seeing more and more uh, violent acts in the borders, you're also seeing the um, people, the soldiers being stripped of their chainmail because that would be a very valuable thing to, to have. So you're seeing bodies that are lying down there and people are, are stripping off their, their weapons and their armor. As we get to the end of the scroll, um, the final words are that the English fled. So to the Upper right, we see um, the foot soldiers going off the, off the scroll there. Um, there's believed to have been another panel to this. Um, we don't know what that panel was. It might have been uh, William's coronation since this started with Edward. Um, it might have ended with him, with, um, with William being crowned king. But you can see that the scroll at this point is starting to get a little beat up. Um, so it may be that the scroll was wound up with the last um, panel um, on the outside and it didn't survive. But again, it's, it's not known for sure exactly what, what happened there. So only three women appear in the story itself um, out of 626 figures. And one, as I mentioned, was Queen Edith, possibly, who was married to Edward the, uh, who was married to Queen Edward the Confessor, and another is the mystery woman, Elfgava. But on the left is an image of a woman, possibly running to shelter her child from the warfare. Although many images of war focus on heroic acts, this tapestry includes images of brutal acts by the soldiers, including the burning of homes of innocent people. William was known to be a vicious leader, and the inclusion of images such as these would celebrate his ruthlessness. Another image I wanted to show you was the representation of Halley's Comet, which was seen as an omen at the time and appears in several scenes. The first known appearance of um, Halley's Comet was in 1066, so this has a datable event um, that would have happened during this time period. Um, it's shown above England's King Harold, and he appears to faint at the sight of it. We will see another representation of an astronomical event in a later quilt, showing how people have looked to the skies throughout history to explain significant events. The work is widely believed to have originally hung in the Bayou Cathedral, which was consecrated July 1077 in Normandy. However, there is much debate on exactly who commissioned the work, where it was created, and where it was intended to hang. 
Some scholars believe that it was commissioned by Queen Matilda, William's wife, and not by Bishop Odo. There is also debate on whether it was created in southern England or in Normandy, and whether it was created by one large workshop or several smaller workshops. Small differences in technique have given rise to the later theory, latter theory. It is also not clear how much is original and how much has been restored over the years. But the work has been the subject of a myriad of scholarly studies, and we are not likely to have a definitive answer to all of these questions. And so the story of the scroll has become as fascinating as the story of the battle itself. The work is currently housed in the Musée de la Tapisserie de Bayou, where it has hung since 1945. It has survived invasions, revolutions, and world wars to tell its story. For example, in the French Revolution, when fabric was scarce, some revolutionaries wanted to cut it up for clothing or as canvases for wagons. In World War II, it was coveted by the Nazis as a symbol of ancestral Germanic pride and celebrated a successful invasion of England, and so was hidden in the basement of the Louvre. Fortunately, it did not fall to either of these fates. The image in the upper left shows Swedish artist Mia Hansen creating a reproduction of the tapestry, which she says took her about 10 years. The stitch at the bottom shows the technique for creating what has been come to be known as the bayou stitch, which is a section of long stitches laid flat with a couching stitch to hold it in place. This and a stem stitch form most of the imagery using eight colors of wool yarn. There is also a, production, a reproduction at the Reading Museum in Reading, England that was created in 1885 by 35 skilled Victorian women. It is a faithful recreation, but as, this was, uh, as this was made in Victorian times, the naked men in the borders had the addition of pants. Actually, 93 naked men appear in the borders. No reason is given why, but they are, like, they are likely to symbol virility. The Reading version also includes an imagined final scene of William's coronation, which is lost from the original work. The Bayou Tapestry is world famous and has made its way into the popular culture of our time. <clears throat> there are cartoon references by the Animaniacs and the Simpsons. This makes sense since the original work can be thought of as an early cartoon or like a film storyboard. A version of the work was done to recreate the entire arc of Game of Thrones, which itself owes a debt to the imagery of the bi original bio tapestry. This scroll is an actual tapestry, meaning that it was woven on a loom with additional embroidery. There is also a Star Wars version, which is done in cross stitch. Okay, so we're going to move on um, several hundred years here and move. I have a question about the Bayou. Sure. Have you mentioned us now? Well, whatever you prefer. Um, I'm going to use my mic so folks can hear me at home. Okay. Um, <clears throat> before we got started, you and I were talking because I shared that I have a degree in medieval literature. And when we studied this particular tapestry, one of the things that we discussed was how it was commissioned probably by somebody in the nobility from the Norman perspective, but probably the artists were English because mm -hmm. they were known for their expert wool work. Right. And the, some of the things that my instructor saw in there were quite subversive in terms of the location of Harold versus William's and their size and their location in the tapestry. So the, the instructor proposed that potentially it was uh, criticism of William, even while it was commissioned mm -hmm. by him or one of his, you know, associates. Do you see that same subversion when you study it? I think there are times when you look at some of them that you think that why would they have shown this particular scene? Why would they have shown it this way? I mean, for the most part, it looks like the Normans are winning all the way through. But um, yeah, there are times when it, it seems like someone, like I said with the, the scandal that was in there, who knows exactly why that was put in there. Maybe that was a, a Norman scandal. Maybe it was an English scandal. We don't know. So yeah, there could be a lot more than meets the eye in, in this. And a lot of people have studied different aspects of that. But that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so we're going to move on to um, several hundred years, and we're going to look at two sets of European tapestries. Unlike the bio tapestry, which is not a tapestry, 
Uh, these works are actual tapestries created in the late 15th and 16th century. In a tapestry, the design is woven directly into the cloth on the loom. Tapestries became popular during this time as they provided warmth against the cold walls of the castle, and they told stories that promoted the stature of the noble houses where they were displayed. They had an advantage over painted portraits in that they could be easily rolled up and transported to another of the family's homes as they traveled between their various estates. And if you watch shows like Downton Abbey or Gilded Age, you can see that the elite did not travel lightly. They brought all their possessions with them. The tapestries often told stories of heroic ancestors, biblical and morality tales, and reflected the virtues of the household. And as textiles were extremely expensive, they reflected the conspicuous consumption of the upper classes. These are two examples of the mythical unicorn as morality tales. <clears throat> On the left is the unicorn and the lady, which hangs in the Musée de Cluny in France. And on the right is the, the unicorn tapestries, which are hung in the cloisters in Manhattan, part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Both were created in approximately the same years. The unicorn and the lady is a set of six wall hangings depicting the five senses plus a final panel to my only desire. The background motif is referred to as mille fleurs or thousand flowers. The lion, which appears in all the panels, represent the symbol of the Laviste family, the original owners of the work. The work shows a transition from the Dark Ages into the period of the Renaissance and represent both secular and religious love as the unicorn was considered a symbol of Christ as well as a symbol of courtly love. So I'm gonna show a few of these here. This first one is sight, which shows the princess holding a mirror. The second one is smell, where she's holding a vial of perfume. Taste shows her servant holding up a plate of food. And then on the lower level, touch as the princess lays her hand on the unicorn's horn. Hearing with the princess playing a musical instrument. And the last panel is desire. While the senses are not difficult to comprehend, the final panel is open to interpretation. It is up to the viewer to decide if the princess is receiving a desired gift or if she's putting away her jewels to renounce worldly goods. Some have interpreted this panel as portraying free will as she is making a choice about the jewels. The tapestries are housed in the Musée National de Moyen Âge, a 15th century castle in Paris. The surroundings suit the original purpose of the works as contemplative and inspirational. Although the unicorn tapestries at the cloisters in New York City are similar in technique and also employ nature as a backdrop to the story, these tapestries are much less contemplative in nature and tell the story of the hunt and capture of a unicorn. There is much more action to this rendering of the tale of the unicorn. The first panel does not include the unicorn itself, but indicates that it has been spotted and the hunt begins. The unicorn is found lying by a body of water. Since unicorns were believed to have purifying powers, the animal is, is left alone to purify the spring. Once the unicorn begins to run, the nobles begin their chase and the unicorn is attacked. The angel Gabriel appears and intervenes on behalf of the animal. However, the courtiers ignore this, and knowing that only a virgin woman can tame a unicorn, they bring in a young woman to transfix the animal. They savagely kill the unicorn and remove its horn as a trophy to present the lord and lady of the house. However, unlike the usual reverie at the end of a successful hunt, the mood is very dour and remorseful. This story is possibly an allegory of Christ's violent death, as the last panel depicts the unicorn as having risen and is surrounded by many flowers and creatures that have biblical significance. It is believed that this may have been commissioned for the walls of the bedchamber of a newly married couple. Six of the panels survive intact, 
but one has only partially survived and there is no knowledge of what happened to the remainder of it. It's shown above the doorway in the um, museum, the cloisters. Any trip to a museum gift shop will no doubt feature merchandising depicting the unicorn tapestries. Also, for those of you familiar with the Harry Potter films, the walls of the House of Gryffindor are covered with two of the Lady and the Unicorn tapestries, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner. This gives Hogwarts Castle a middle, medieval feel, and as the lion is the symbol of Gryffindor House, they feature the lions of the tapestry. Sorry, my paper's sticking together here. We will now jump ahead, just on, oh, I didn't want to jump that far ahead. Jump ahead just under four centuries and land in the American South. We now can attach a name to the artist who created the works which we will be discussing. Harriet Powers was born into slavery in Madison County, Georgia in 1837. Once freed, she moved to Dondi, Georgia in 1872 and to Athens, Georgia in 1876. She was married, had nine children, and died in 1911. <coughs> her known quilts represented biblical stories and everyday life. Two of her quilts exist today and are owned by the Smithsonian and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Both quilts came from humble beginnings and are now considered national treasures. Both use the technique of applique, meaning sewing shapes directly to the background fabric. This quilt is called the Bible Quilt from 1888, and it was known as a sermon in patchwork. It was displayed in what was referred to as the Negro Building at the Atlanta Exposition in 1895. There were segregated sections of exhibitions and fairs, as well as annual colored fairs, which solely featured African-American artists at the time. The biblical quilt received attention from a local journalist who referred to Ms. Powers as an elderly woman who could not read nor write. This wasn't true. Ms. Powers was in her 50s at the time and was literate from a young age. At the fair, a woman named Jenny Smith offered to buy it. Ms. Powers did not want to sell it until four years later when Ms. Smith eventually bought it for $5, although Ms. Powers had asked for 10. Ms. Smith hung it in her home and until her death, when it became property of her executor, who ultimately donated it to the Smithsonian in 1969. From top left to right, the stories are Adam and Eve naming the animals and being tempted by a serpent, Adam and Eve with their son Cain, and then the devil surrounded by seven stars. In the middle row, Cain killing his brother Abel with Cain's sheep witnessing the attack, Cain and his wife in the city of Nod, Jacob asleep as the angel either ascends or descends from Jacob's ladder, and John baptizing Jesus with a dove flying above. In the bottom row, we have Christ's crucifixion with circular objects which represent the darkness over the earth and the moon turning into blood. The next is Judy with, Judas with 30 pieces of silver. Circular object is a star that appeared in 1886 for the first time in 300 years. Next is the Last Supper. Judas is pictured in drab, being a little off color in character was what was written on the, um, the description of this. The Holy Family, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus with the Star of Bethlehem and crosses. And this slide shows uh, a photograph of the Bible quilt displayed in the 1896 at the Atlanta Exposition, which is a really great resource to have because it's, there's not much else available about this, but we can see it as it was displayed in the exposition. And this on the right is just a uh, detail of Cain killing Abel, which is you can see in the middle left-hand side of the quilt on the left side. This is the pictorial quilt. Lara had asked me my favorite quilt, and this one is my favorite. <laughs> there is no information on how Ms. Powers' quilt, known as a pictorial quilt, left her hands and became the property of Dr. Charles C. Hall, other than it had been gifted to him in 1898 by the faculty ladies of Atlanta University. 
Dr. Hall was a Presbyterian minister and in 1898 became president of the Union Theological Society and could possibly have received the quilt as a gift for this occasion. Dr. Hall was a strong supporter of higher education for African Americans. According to his daughter, Catherine Hammer Hall Preston, the quilt hung on the wall of the family's home in Westport Point, Massachusetts, attached to the wall with what she referred to as simple tacks. Dr. Hall's son, the Reverend Basil Hall, sold the quilt to the Museum of Fine Arts in 1960. Although the actual sale price isn't known, a letter from Reverend Hall indicates that the museum curator of textiles was willing to offer $500 for the quilt. The quilt was not exhibited until 1975. The quilt itself is a collection of unrelated squares, some biblical and some of nature. <coughs> Postcards with descriptions of each square accompanied the sale of the quilt. The stories are, again, from left to right. and start with Job praying for his enemies. The next one is Black Friday. This occurred in May 19, 1780, and was known as the Dark Day, as Canadian wildflowers are believed to have caused the day to turn to dark in the Northeast. And we know we went through this the summer with Canadian wildflowers, fires turning dark. But back then, they, th they thought that that was a sign of Judgment Day or some really um, important uh, omen because it must have been important for her to know about it 100 years later. Uh, next, we see Moses with a serpent, then Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and Christ being baptized. In the middle row is Jonah and the whale, the creation of the animals, falling stars, more pairs of animals, and then angels called by God to pour out seven vials of wrath from Revelations 15:16. The last row shows an unusually heavy snowfall, February 10th, 1895. Meteor showers in the next one, August 10th and 11th, 1846, with God's hand in the upper left-hand corner protecting the people. <coughs> and this is my favorite square. It's sort of local news. Um, a lot of these other things that she's showing are, are, are events that might have been in, in the papers, but this one is specific to her area. Um, this features Bob and Kate Bell of Virginia, who were presumed to not know about God, <coughs> and Betts, a hog which ran 500 miles from Georgia to Virginia. So there are stories there. We don't know what they were, but um, I think that's great that she's included that in this quilt. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have more pairs of animals, and then Christ crucified with two thieves while Mary and Martha weep. So when we were talking about the Bayou Tapestry, I mentioned the image of Halley's Comet, which was visible in May 1066. Images of people pointing up to the phenomenon are echoed in this Powers quilt, showing people looking up at the falling stars of the Leonid meteor storm in November 1883. These images give us insight into actual datable events, as well as showing the fascination people had with the heavens. The Leonid showers of 1883 instilled fear in people that it was a sign announcing that the Judgment Day was near. Artistic references to celestial phenomena have a long history. In Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, Calpurnia states, when beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes, prophesizing the Caesar comet of 44 BC, the year he died. Reproductions of uh, Harriet Power's quilt were created for sale by the Smithsonian in the 1990s, and versions of the quilts have been made into commercial sale. Brian, a little show and tell. One example is this bed covering, which I bought many years before I had heard of Harriet Powers. Is this a good place to show it? Okay. If you like, I can hold it for you. And Okay. It's not an exact reproduction, but it was most definitely influenced by Ms. Power's work. Thanks. It's not hard to see similarities between modern art and the traditional art of quilting. If we look at Henri Matisse's paper cutouts, 
we see the representation of his story of Icarus done much in the same fashion as Ms. Power's cloth cutouts. While his is a mythological story and hers is a biblical one, they both reduce the human figure to a basic recognizable form. Okay, and I have one more block of quilts to show you. Uh, Bisa Butler is a contemporary fiber artist whose applique quilts are vivid portraits of real people and situations. Her influences include quilt artists such as Harriet Powers and Bertha Stang, Faith Rheingold, and the photographer Gordon Parks. She includes textiles, painting, and photography in her work, creating awareness of African American history and present day life. Ms. Butler begins with photographs, as seen in this Russell Lee photograph of 1941 in the upper left. She enlarges the photographs and then cuts them into pattern pieces to be cut out of the appropriate fabric. She searches for textiles that will correspond with what she feels would best represent these figures and eliminates background imagery to focus on the individuals. Most of these textiles she uses are African-inspired prints that often have symbolic meaning. She portrays images of everyday life, such as the image of a migrant family seen here in the warmth of other suns, as well as portraits of famous African Americans, such as Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, basketball legend Bill Russell, and musician Questlove. The portrait that Ms. Butler has created here could not seem more innocent. Four young girls, their dresses swirling in motion as they smile and pose in their Sunday best, show no indication of the horror that is to befall them. Many artists chose to show the dreadful aftermath of the bombing to make their statement, but Ms. Butler chose to celebrate these girls and thus have the viewer confront the loss of these girls as they were in life. According to Christina Sharp in her book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, black people are often defined by and visually represented through context of subjugation, suffering, violence, and death. Ms. Butler takes a different tack, focusing on the lives of individuals through vibrant colors, textures, and expression. And these are, uh, this is just a composite of the girls. It's not um, a picture of the four of them that, as they were together, but this shows the, the, um, the girls that she based this on. So like the work of Harriet Powers and Henri Matisse, Color is not a direct representation in the figures. Rather, color is used as emotional expression. According to Matisse, in his statement, Notes of a Painter, the choice of colors does not rest in scientific theory. It is based on observation, on sensitivity, on felt experiences. We see this in Ms. Butler's work as skin tones range from greens and blues to yellows and reds using many combinations of fabric. Although all of these works of art were made by different techniques and in different time periods, they are all pictorial representations of stories that tell us about the lives of the people they depict. They range from military heroes, the nobility, biblical figures, and everyday people, but all tell us about life in the era in which they were created. Along with the themes of the wall hangings, the stories of how they're created, by whom and for whom, and how they have survived provide compelling stories as well. As textile art has become more accepted as high art, many museums have begun to feature works by textile artists beginning in the 1970s. A recent exhibit at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston called Fabric of a Nation, American Quilt Stories, featured work by both Harriet Powers and Bisa Butler and many other American quilt artists. And perhaps you have quilts in your own homes that tell stories of your own families. Thank you again for coming to the talk tonight and I have some, table, some books in the back if anyone wants to look at those about this topic, or I would be happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you. So you mentioned that uh, work as your favorite. Can you tell us why, in particular, you're so drawn to that one? Well, I think largely because I had that bed quilt for I don't know how many years before we saw that it was an actual work of art in a museum. Yeah, it was 30 years. yeah, yeah. So it was just something I saw, and I love the colors, I love the patterns, and then to see the actual one and to 
to know the story of that quilt, of you know, how it came to be to the Museum of Fine Art, which is you know, right here for us all to enjoy, uh, it was, it's just has a great personal meaning for me. And the images, as I said, they range from you know, things that you could learn about weather 100 years before to a pig running 500 miles. <laughs> So it's told so many different stories in, in ways that um, some were obvious and some you had to know what they were to, to figure it out. But I love how she uses just, and you see this in um, uh, a lot of textiles of the period where they would just use sort of random colors for people. It was like when Matisse was saying that we don't have to make these realistic. They can just be what they are, you know, you know that they're people and that's all you need to know. We don't need to know who they are exactly or why they're wearing this clothing. We don't need to know the color of their skin. They're just people and, and I love that about the quilt. You mentioned the <clears throat> recent acceptance of um, textile arts as high art. Mm -hmm. um, surely in your first two examples, those at the time must have been considered high, higher art at least. Um, so what do you think kind of happened in the in-between to where that was art and then there was a period where it was less accepted as high art and now it's kind of coming back into the high art culture again. Mm -hmm. Well, I think embroidery at the time of the biotapestry was something that every woman, every noble woman at least did and they were, you know, they were judged on their skill. But there weren't places to necessarily display it like a museum. It would be either in their homes or for the church. And again, with the tapestries, they would be in castles. They would be um, not for public consumption. And it's not really until you get later in, in museums. Um, but for a while, I think, because uh, quilt, quilting particularly was known sort of as a woman's art. It wasn't, um, or a woman's craft, not so much an art, but as a craft. Um, painting became the popular medium and that's where the money was in, in painting you know so um, a lot of these quilts um, sort of fell out of favor as sort of old-fashioned you know and then all of a sudden and when you get into the the 60s and the 70s people are men and women are starting to create quilts that are abstract and um, you know that that are very much more uh, artistic in the sense than rather than being practical, like a bed covering or a wall covering. Um, they were just made for art. So I think that that's when you start to see people appreciating women's art more and people starting to appreciate craft in general more. But then Harriet Powers. Oh, okay, sure. When you look at the Harriet Powers, um, do you think the museums consider this important work because it's textile or because it's sort of folk art or or both does that make sense i think both i think folk art um definitely started to become more popular um and also the the museum of fine arts doesn't have that many works of art by african americans and i think that this is something that they can show and um, is representative of the African American community. And I think it, it shows that not all paintings or not all works in museums have to be done by white males. I think this shows um, something that they could be proud of that they own. Is there a particular work, textile work that you wish that you could have included because it's one of your favorites, but it didn't work with the, the story you're trying to tell within this lecture? Oh, too many. <laughs> Um, I love G's Bend. Um, Mary and I were talking about that before. Uh, I think their quilts are incredible. Um, but there's so many different ones. And they don't necessarily tell a story so much as they tell a color story, as they tell a, a feeling. Um, they, so it didn't really fit into my, my um, category here. But tell us what G's Bend is. Oh, G's Bend was um, our women. That, they're still around. They're, they're creating quilts. Um, they still hold workshops. You can go down and, and work with them to create quilts. But the, the quilts are more abstract. They're, they're patchworks of color um, that don't necessarily look like they might go together, but when they do, they just work so well. 
Um, so they have a particular style, and their, their style was copied by a lot of people, like Pottery Barn, and they would take their images but not compensate them for them. So these women actually fought that. Um, they, they fought back against that and, and um, got some uh, compensation for their work, which was great. This is the eternal question when it comes to art. So in your opinion, where is the line between a skilled craftsperson versus a work of art? Yeah, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, I guess it's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, I don't really know that there's any line that you can draw for that because, you know, like with uh, Matisse's cutouts, what's the difference between that and someone cutting out pieces of fabric and putting them on fabric? Um, paintings are on canvas. They're already textiles, you know, it's just, it's just very hard to delineate between the two. And, and it, it is meshing a lot more now, I think. I mean, they don't get the prices if you're looking at it as a, as a you know, a sort of a monetary um, way of looking at things. But I would assume something like the unicorn and the lady tapestries would be pretty priceless at this point. And of course, the, the, the bio tapestry, you know, that's, no one's gonna sell that. <laughs> But yeah, it, it's it's difficult to make that make that call. I think Bisa Butler really crosses those lines. I think you can't not say that this is that this is an art. It it absolutely is, you know. So I think we see more of that. Any questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Professor Seabor Cable. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for those who were able to make it in person. Um, thank you to those who were able to make it online. We would love to have you join us next Thursday at 7 p.m. to listen to the Framingham History Center. Um, please feel free to join us online, or if you'd like to join us in person, we do have coffee and cookies. Um, and then for those of you who are here in the room, we would love to hear from you on our evaluation forms in the back. Thank you again, and have a good night. Okay.